diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, is what we will discuss. And uh, DKA is a very serious consequence uh, that occurs in type 1 diabetes mellitus. And it basically is due to the fact that you have very uh, inadequate insulin levels. And I'm going to try my best to um, go through the pathophysiology of uh, DKA. And in the pathophysiology explanation, I'm trying to cover about five things that are important to understand. The first is the concept of hyperglycemia. The second is that in DKA you have something called ketoacidosis, which is part of the word actually, diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, the next thing I'm going to try to explain is ketonuria, increased ketones in the urine. Number four is uh, hypokalemia, decreased potassium in the blood, and the, finally uh, osmotic diuresis. So these are all components of uh, DKA. So I'm going to need as much room as possible. So here we go. Normally, what happens is the body has a mechanism of getting glucose inside the cells. So our cells in our body, our peripheral cells, require insulin uh, to get the glucose into the cells. So that's what insulin does. It helps bring glucose into the cells. I kind of remember it as insulin into cells. And then once the glucose goes inside the cells, through a series of chemical reactions that produces ATP, which is used as energy. So glucose is essentially a form of energy uh, that um, the cells uh, use. Now, what happens in insulin deficiency, which is uh, a consequence of having type 1 diabetes, is that the cell now all of a sudden the glucose can't go inside so if the glucose can't go inside the cell the glucose then accumulates in the blood and increased levels of glucose in the blood are known as hyperglycemia so that's the first part of the five things now remember the cells all of a sudden have been deprived of the source of energy so they go into essentially a state of starvation and then the body reacts by producing all an alternative form of energy. So that's the next part of the explanation. So where does the cells now to get their energy from? Glucose can't go inside the cell because we don't have enough insulin. Well, what they do is they turn to the fat cells. And these fat cells are known as adipocytes and they release free fatty acids uh, abbreviated FFA and the free fatty acids then enter the bloodstream and that is the beginning of the process alternative process of producing energy a source of energy the free fatty acids then go to the liver And the liver then takes these free fatty acids and converts it to ketones. And that's an extremely important part of uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Then these ketones then go into the bloodstream. And that essentially is known as ketoacidosis because ketones are acids. So that's the next part of the five things. Now another name for a ketoacidosis is metabolic acidosis. Just in case you are wondering if the two terms mean the same, they do. It's the same thing. So now what happens is these uh, ketones are now readily available as an alternative form of energy. So then what happens is the peripheral cells in our body
such as cells in the muscle, cells in the heart, and other parts of the body, take these ketones in to use as a source of energy. But unfortunately, the amount of ketones in the blood are excessive. So some of these ketones remain in the bloodstream. And when they remain in the bloodstream, they cause this ketoacidosis. And ketoacidosis has very specific consequences in the uh, lab values. The first thing that it does is it gets the pH to go down below 7.3. Remember, you're in a state of acidosis. The next thing that happens is the serum bicarb level goes down by carbonate. The next thing that happens is one of the byproducts of ketones is acetone. And acetone, the body tries to remove by breathing it out. So your respiratory rate goes up. And then finally, the acetone actually causes your breath to have a certain odor. It's known as a fruity odor. So, so those are some of the consequences of ketoacidosis. So now we need to talk about the next three things. Well, what happens is these excess ketones then go to the kidney. So we'll draw a kidney here. So they go to the kidney and then the kidney then removes them in the urine. And that's known as ketonuria, ketones in the urine. Now, when the ketones are removed in the urine, unfortunately, electrolytes go with it. So the electrolytes that we're talking about is sodium and potassium. So sodium goes out and so does potassium. So when you kick out excess amounts of potassium, you get hypokalemia. And then finally, the one final thing I need to mention is, remember we had all that excess glucose? We had hyperglycemia, the number one point. Well, what happened to that glucose? Did it just stay in the bloodstream? Well, that glucose also went to the kidney and it also got kicked out into the urine. But what's interesting about glucose in the urine is that when you have excess glucose in the urine, it pulls water with it. So you have an enormous amount of water being coming out into the urine, and that is known as osmotic diuresis, where this excess glucose goes to the kidney, it goes filters through the kidney into the urine, but then since you have so much glucose in the urine, it pulls water along with it. And that osmotic diuresis is what leads to the volume depletion in the patients. Volume depletion, dehydration. So I hope that was a very uh, concise explanation of the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. So what are the symptoms? Well, the patient will be very sick, some nonspecific symptoms such as nausea and vomiting. Remember, the patient is in the state of volume depletion, dehydration. So you'll have low blood pressure. And then also, I touched about this a uh, little bit, is that the body is going to try to remove those excess um, byproducts of ketones, which is acetone, by increasing the respiratory rate. And there's a special name given to this type of rapid, uh, shallow breathing that occurs in diabetic ketoacidosis, known as cusmol respirations. Now it comes to the diagnosis, and the diagnosis kind of goes hand in hand with the physiology, the pathophysiology, it's almost identical. So remember the first thing was hyperglycemia. So you want to check the blood glucose level. And the next thing of course is you want to check the electrolytes. So electrolytes such as sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, and the bicarb level is actually particularly important. It's going to be less than 18 in DKA. And it's actually very important because it can be uh, an indicator of the severity of uh, the DKA case. The next thing you want to check is the pH. And because we're in a state of acidosis, the pH is going to be about less than 7.3 ketoacidosis, metabolic acidosis. 
Next thing you want to check is the serum ketone level. Because diabetic ketoacidosis, you're definitely going to have ketones, excess ketones in the bloodstream. And then you can also check ketones in the urine because ketonuria is part of uh, the um, uh, processed pathophysiology of DKA. And then one final thing I wanted to touch on is the anion gap. And this is very important. The anion gap is a calculation. And it's basically a formula. It's the sodium minus the chloride plus the bicarb. So for example, if you had a patient where the sodium was 137 and the chloride was, let's say, 90, and the bicarb level was 22, the anion gap would be 137 minus 90 plus 22, which equals 25. And in DKA, the anion gap will be greater than 12. So remember that. And then finally, the treatment. The treatment also goes hand in hand with the pathophysiology. Remember, the very first thing is hyperglycemia. So you want to correct that by giving insulin. And the insulin will then drive all that excess glucose back into the cells, which is desperately needed. And you give it approximately 0 0.1 units per kg per hour as an IV uh, administration. The next thing, of course, if you remember the pathophysiology, was ketoacidosis. But as glucose goes back into the cells, the cells start utilizing it as energy so that it won't need to produce ketones. They won't need to release the free fatty acids. So the ketones will slowly start to decline in the body. And then, same thing, if you don't have ketones in the bloodstream, the ketones won't appear in the urine, so the ketonuria will eventually go away just by giving insulin and then the next one of course is you want to correct the potassium so the because in DKA you are in a state of hypokalemia so potassium is given essentially what you do is you add about 20 to 30 milli equivalents of potassium to each liter of IV fluids and that of course takes us to the third uh, part of the treatment which is IV fluids and initially it's given as saline 0 0.9 saline and this uh, fluid is uh, uh, definitely needed to help uh, replenish the volume and help the state of dehydration that DKA patients are in so if you understand the pathophysiology all of this will make sense the diagnosis the treatment it's all tied to the pathophysiology, so please uh, repeat that uh, part of the, the lecture uh, and then under understand it fully. So let's take a look at some vignettes. 52-year-old male with diabetes mellitus reports that he ran out of insulin of a week ago. He is drowsy but responds to your verbal commands, and the remainder of his exam is unremarkable. Lab findings show blood glucose 625 serum sodium 128, serum potassium 5.9, serum bicarb 12, and BUN 52. Which of the following lab abnormalities is an indication that he has severe diabetic ketoacidosis? Well, the severity of uh, DKA is uh, basically uh, something that you need to figure out by looking at these lab values. And at, and at first, a lot of these lab values might be indicators of how severe it is, but there's one in particular, and that is the bicarb level. The bicarb level will be less than 18 in DKA, and the lower it is, the more severe the DKA. So the answer to this question is D. Next question, a 19-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department by her parents because of confusion. Parents tell you that over the last two weeks, the patient has had an 11-pound weight loss uh, and fatigue. She has been constantly using the bathroom, but they assumed it was only because she seems to be drinking huge amounts of liquids. Parents reported that no previous medical problems. 
Last menstrual period is three days ago. You notice a stuporous white female, which appears thin in moderate distress. Blood pressure is a, a 90 over 40, temp is 100, pulse is 115, respirations are 30. Physical exam so shows dry mucous membranes, sunken eyes, pale appearance. Breath is noticeably fruity odor. Heart is tachycardic and regular without any murmurs. Abdomen soft, non-distended, with decreased bowel sounds, with some mild diffuse tenderness. Extremities are cool with weak pulses. Most likely diagnosis will be established with. Well, she's got a lot of uh, common symptoms here. She's got the polyuria. Uh, she's going to the bathroom of a lot most likely because of all those ketones and glucose. She's got very significant signs of dehydration, such as the dry mucous membranes, the sunken eyes, and she's got this noticeably fruity odor, which is essentially the ketones that she's trying to exhale out. And all this needs to be uh, diagnosed very quickly by doing some simple blood tests, and that is glucose and electrolytes. And finally, 18-year-old man with type 1 diabetes brought to the emergency department by a friend after being found comatose. He has well-known history of non-compliance with medications. However, there is no known history of drug use. The vital signs are temperature is 98, blood pressure is 80 over 65, pulse is 110, respirations are 17. Oxygen saturation is 98% uh, on 2 liters of oxygen. Patient is comatose and taking rapid, shallow breaths. Deep tendon reflexes are hypoactive. IV line has been placed in the field. Finger stick glucose is 430. An ABG basic chem panel and toxicology screen has been sent to the lab. Next step in management is, well, these rapid shallow breaths are those small respirations. And this clinical vignette essentially spells it out for you. He's a diabetic, non-compliant with very high blood sugar and he's got these cusmal respirations he went into a comatose state he's in DKA there's no doubt about it so remember the first thing you need give him some insulin and give him some fluids so that would be choice D choice C sorry